uh, welcome to lesson 10. So, that is simultaneously simultaneous sample and hold. Now, before we look at the eddy converter, let us take a look at some sampling concepts. You know, first thing that we must remember that uh, the sampling value which you get from the eddy converter is at the sampling instant. So, it is just at the sampling instant and ideally speaking, so you have you have a signal. So, you have a signal analog and you are getting the sampling it here and here and here I am sort of exa exaggerating actually you do not sample it so farther away you sample it much closer. But to just to drive home the point what I am saying is that you have got the value of the signal here and the value of the signal here and ideally speaking you do not know what the values of the signals are over over let us say here or here or here you do not know that because you have not got those values right. So, what you what you do is you you make an assumption right. So, so the the hold why, why I say the hold strategy is that this this hold is not the sample and hold because the sample and hold will simply hold the signal, but when you are using the signal for, for example, suppose you want to plot this signal on, on a graph. So, are you going to plot it as if this signal is held up to this point and then held up to this point and then come, comes down. So, are you going to plot it like this when you are going to plot it or are you going to plot it like this then let me use a different color. The alternate way of plotting it would be to plot it from between this and this it is a straight line like this, but between this and this you would say that I will interpolate I will do a linear interpolation. So, when I will plot it I will plot this yellow line right. So, what I am saying is that if you want to plot it as an as an as a, as a continuous signal then you may choose appropriate uh, interpolation strategies for to construct a continuous signal which will be an approximate version of the old signal. Now, the question is so obviously, you can you can understand that how accurate this digital approximation is with the analog one depends on what. So, it depends on two things firstly it depends on how close like for example, if you had if you had taken rather than doing it this far if you had divided it into let us say these intervals and if you had got this value and this value and this value then your approximation would have been like this right. So, you would have gone from here to here from here to here and from here to here and then here to so you, so you see that you are able to do and then you would have got it here and here and here. So, you would have followed the analog signal much more close. So, in general closer sampling will give you better accuracy, but, but it is also a lot of but it is also more work. So, uh, 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 more work faster so faster sampling and faster data processing. So, you have to determine what is the appro appropriate level of error that you can tolerate and what is the maximum amount of work that you can do within a given time right. So, it turns out that there are certain fundamental principles to be obeyed because if you do not do that if you if you, you so, so ideally speaking you would like to sample uh, you would like to sample at the lowest possible rate uh, and trying to keep the error uh, low and especially you would generally you would like to keep the high frequency errors low uh, you, you, you may have some high frequency errors, but generally you want that the low frequency errors uh, that is the let us say the average values over certain time intervals etcetera should be pretty accurate right. So, the generally the low frequency component of the of the signal is actually of more use for the purposes that we are discussing and so we, we do not want low frequency errors right. So, that is what I am saying that if you have an analog input and if you have 4 samples per cycle and if you have 8 samples per cycle and if you have 16 samples per cycle. So, you see gradually you are getting a better and better representation of the analog input. Now, there is a you know benchmark rule which everybody uh, talks about is called the so called the, Na the, the Nyquist rate of sampling actually this is this concept is, is explained in this diagram. 
that imagine that you actually truly have this sine wave which you are sampling this is the real analog wave right this is the real analog wave and being not aware of the Nyquist sampling theorem you have sampled it at these points right. So, what happens is that now, now, now you would like to reconstruct the signal right now in the computer you have got these values. So, when you reconstruct the signal you will suppose you do a linear reconstruction. So, you you will get this way. So, you see that what you actually reconstructed is a much lower frequency sine wave and this high frequency sine wave is completely lost. So, you made a major error here it is not it, 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 so it, it turns out that theoretically speaking you cannot reconstruct a signal unless you sample it at twice the rate of the largest frequency content that is largest frequency signal that is present. So, so suppose you have a signal which is 5 hertz and another signal which is 100 hertz then theoretically speaking you cannot reconstruct the signal even with an infinite number of samples unless you sample it at least at 200 hertz right. But since we are not concerned with theoretical reconstruction we have to actually reconstruct it. So, therefore, a practical rate would be 5 to 10 times of the maximum samples um, maximum sampling fre uh, maximum frequency signal present. So, if you have 100 hertz present you typically like to uh, sample it at 1 kilohertz or minimum 500 hertz right. So, this says that so basically if you do not do that what there is there is something happens called aliasing aliasing means that one one frequency signal will appear from the samples to be of completely a different frequency it will appear as a different lower frequency signal. So, you are going to get a lot of low frequency error which is which is bad generally. So, so exactly that is what is happening. So, your original signal was oops. So, your I do not know what is happening here there is some problem with this uh, let me let me. So, uh, yep, maybe no, it will work now. Oh, 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 I understand what is happening. I understand what is happening. Yep, yep, but I do not understand why how it came to be. Okay, uh, so so that's what is uh, so that's what happens. One frequency appears in another, another frequency, and that's called aliasing. So therefore, what do you do? What what you do is so now this leads to uh, a concept. So 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 what you do is you actually need to restrict. So you have a certain sampling rate which is fixed. You can't change that. You don't know what frequency components are actually present in the analog signal. So, to make sure that you do not get low frequency errors what you do is you actually put a filter which whose cutoff frequency ensures that you have no frequencies beyond let us say uh, one tenth of the sampling frequency. So, the sampling frequency is fixed, but the anti alias you actually put a filter which is called the anti aliasing filter which will ensure that whatever the signal content is only those frequencies which are less than one tenth of the sampling frequency are going to go through and appear at the input of the AD converter the others are going to get blocked. So, that they cannot create any low frequency error right ok. Having understood the basic idea of uh, sampling we show the. So, we say that an anti aliasing filter is an analog filter that removes signal frequencies above f s by 2 where f s is the sample frequency actually the f s by 2 is actually a theoretical rate it will not remove above f s by 2, but would perhaps in a practical case remove frequency above f s by 5 or even f s by 10. So, it is a low pass filter incidentally. So, this is 
So, you put that filter typically between the signal conditioner and the uh, ADC uh, or in a multi channel case you put it uh, either at the channels or you put it after the multiplexer. So, here is a sample and hold circuit very simple one. Uh, so, uh, for example, so you, you, you can see that you have uh, two amplifiers this, this is nothing but a buffer ok. So, this is nothing but a buffer. So, whenever so this is a switch you know this is an electronic switch. So, whenever you turn this switch on this is a this is a, this is a MOS. So, when you, whenever you turn this switch on what happens is that these two points you can say that they are connected ok. So, this is a buffer unity gain buffer. So, whatever voltage you apply here they will apply here and they will charge it up this capacitance very quickly this switch resistance is small. So, it will fast charge up and this capacitor voltage will as long as this switch is on this capacitor voltage will, will, will follow this voltage right. So, that is the sampling phase. So, as long as this switch is on this voltage is tracking this voltage changing along with that. The moment you turn this switch off, so now this switch is off and this capacitor voltage on this side sees high impedance on this side also sees high impedance. So, the charge in the capacitor cannot escape right. So, this voltage the last voltage with the capacitor had is held and this is another buffer. So, this output will now be held at this voltage. Next time you put it on again this this capacitor voltage is going to change according to V 1. So, you first switch it on that is the that is the sample command this capacitor voltage starts tracking this voltage then you switch it off and this voltage is held which is transferred to the output right. So, this is a typical sample and hold circuit. So, we have to understand that then there are a number of input analog channels and the input channels can be differential or single ended as I said and I explained the meaning. Now, the this multiplexing says that the if you are the that is the maximum suppose the eddy converter can can uh, can convert let us say theoretically speaking 100,000 samples per second. If you are if you are having 8 channels then effectively each channel maximum can be sampled at 100,000 samples divided by 8. So, that is the throughput and so, so the number of so actually the uh, often times it happens that the sampling uh, maximum sampling rate specifications of the eddy converter are given and the number of channels are given. So, one has to uh, be able to infer what is the maximum sampling frequency per channel. So, that is the final sampling frequency per channel that is going to be effective on the each channels. So, that is why this throughput question comes. So, next let us let let us come to the question of quantization. So, we have now seen that an analog signal after sample and hold present itself at the analog input pin of the AD converter right. So, uh, now it gets converted to an n bit digital number right. So, so, for example, here is a case that suppose you have this is a 3 bit ADC right that is somewhat hypothetical, but 3 bit ADC where so which means so with 3 bits you can represent 8 numbers 2 to the power 3 right from 0 1 2 3 4 up to 2 to the power 3 minus 1 that is 7. So, 0 to 7. So, you see that the, the number 0 corresponds to 0 volts and the first the 1 corresponds to 0 0.125 volt it is so suppose the every ADC has what is called an analog reference voltage which which decides its dynamic range as I was talking about. So, hypothetically if the dynamic range is 1 volt generally it is 10 volts <coughs> 10 volts is a very typical figure suppose it is 1 volt then the then each so 2 to the power 3 is equal to 1. So, 1 to the power 3 digital is equal to 1 volt. So, 1 digital or, or the number 0 0 1 represents 1 by 8 volts right. So, 
this signal will become from 0 to from 0 0 0 to 0 0 1 when this signal reaches 0 0.125 volts or 1 by 8 volts. So, actually the any signal between 0 and 0 0.125 will get quantized to this 0, this is called quantization, right. Similarly, 0 0.125 to 0 0.25 all these will get mapped to 0, 0 0 1 and so on. And finally, 0 0.875 to 1 volts will, will get mapped to 1 1 1. So, this is quantization and obviously, uh, the higher the number of bits, the smaller is that is, is the quantization interval and the better is the resolution. But then we can always make an eddy converter of 32 bits, 64 bits, why not? Because these are related to, because you have to make them, the, it is not just the number of bits. Finally, the they must represent that, that mapping that 1 represents 0.125, this must be accurate. So, when you increase the number of bits, you can understand that if you have let us say a 16 bit eddy converter, then you have 1 by 65,000 is your resolution, right. So, the circuit should be able to resolve between 1 by 65,000 will be you know something like uh, not even milli volts, right, it is, it is of the order of micro volts. So, the circuit should be so accurate that and the, the environment should be so less noisy that you will be able to separate between those. If you do not do that, then your audio converter just because of noise, it will this even if you present a constant signal, it is it, its digital bits will start oscillating and the last few bits will anyway be useless because of noise. So, that is why it is very difficult to uh, construct eddy converters of uh, number of bits more than you know 18 maybe. And generally for this kind of things 12 to 16 are used 12, 14 or 16. So, we have so you see eddy converter resolution and range. So, now finally, the signal this the accuracy is affected by the range, so range is so finally, when you have a number, how do you convert that number? Suppose you have a number 0, 0, 1 and it is a and it is a 3 bit eddy converter. So, the number is actually 0, 0, 1 divided by 2 to the power 3. So, 1 0, 0, 1 by by 2 to the power 3 which is so it is 1 by 8 into the reference voltage. In this case, suppose it is 1 volt, so it is 0 0.125. So, so that is how, so, so obviously you can understand that as the number of bits will go up, the resolution will increase and the minimum on the other hand, if you have a, suppose you have a 10 volts range and you have a 1 volt signal. Now, the point is that you could actually amplify this 1 volt signal. So, if you use a, let us say, a, let us we can write here also that suppose you have a converter which is a dynamic range of 10 volts and you are giving it a signal whose peak to peak value is 1 volt, right. So, then peak to peak value is 1 volt means the lowest number and it is a 3 bit converter. So, then the lowest value is 1.25. So, this 0 to 1 very, uh, minus 1 to or let us say let us say 0 to let us talk about unipolar signals no, not negative. So, so, suppose 0 to 1 if you have a signal then always you will get the value 0, it will the, the the, the variation will not be caught at all. On the other hand, if you had amplified it this 1 volt to 10 volt and then taken care of this amplification factor in your software, then this signal this 1 volt signal variation would have been captured up to 3 bit resolution. So, this shows that always it is you must have amplification enough amplification that is why people sometimes put programmable gain amplifiers, amplifiers whose gains can be changed again under software controls, but although they are expensive. So, you need to always amplify the signal, so that the eddy converter dynamic range that is the range between the reference voltage up to the reference voltage is actually effectively utilized by the input, then you get the best resolution for a given number of bits. This is important to remember during data acquisition. So, now we are going to take a look at some uh, eddy converters, but, but then before that we have a we take a look at a DA converter because an eddy converter circuit at least the most one of the most common things like the successive convert uh, approximation converter uses a DA converter. So, we, we just take a quick look at what is a digital to analog converter that is if we put a set of digital bits how can we get an analog voltage which will be proportional to that number. So, this is called an R 2 R ladder network for obvious reasons you can see that 2 R 2 R. So, there are some arc R and there are some 2 R resistances there and double ratio. 
So, that is why this is called an R to R ladder network, ladder because of this form structure. So, you see that you can it is rather easy to show using simple network theory that you see these are the switches which are actually controlled by these bits. So, now suppose let us let us take the simplest case that if I switch only this MSB, so it will get connected here and all the others are connected to this ground, this is connected to ground. So, then what is the voltage that will appear here? That is very simple because you have 2 R and 2 R in parallel now, this is connected to ground. So, therefore, it, this resistance is R. Now, this that R and this R is in series, so it is 2 R, again 2 R and 2 R in parallel, again R, again R and R in series, again 2 R and so on. So, finally, what you get, finally, what you get is a, finally, you get this network. So, you have a 2 R, you have an 2 R and then you have a voltage source. So, this is your V, this is your V ref and then you have an R and then you have an amplifier and here you have a 2 R. So, R, 2 R, 2 R, 2 R. So, if you do a Thevenin circuit for this, this what will be what will be this voltage? This voltage is so the so the so the open circuit voltage is going to be V by 2. So, it is going to be V by 2 here and what is going to be the Thevenin impedance? It is going to be 2 R parallel 2 R which is R. So, this circuit can be further reduced into a network of this form. So, it can be further reduced as V by 2 in series with a resistance R which is a Thevenin network, then another R which is this one and then the amplifier which is 2 R. So, this R and this R will make 2 R and this 2 R and 2 R will give you a gain of 1. So, you get V by 2, right. And so, if you have a total range of the eddy converters, then the MSB should have a total range of n bit converter, then the MSB should have a weightage of V by 2. And you can see that if you only switch on this MSB, you get a V ref by 2 signal here. In this way, you can show that if you if you kept all the others grounded and you put on the next bit on, you would have got V by 4, similarly V by 8 and so on. So, now if you depending on your digital numbers, if you if you if you switch on some of them and 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 and, and do not switch on some of them, then you get a corresponding because this, this is a linear circuit. So, you are going to get superposition principle. So, the final signal is going to be V ref properly weighted by the by the with the with the binary number weighting. So, you will get a analog voltage which is going to be proportional to the digital number. That is why it is called a digital to analog converter. So, in our uh, So, for example, in this eddy converter, this which, which is called successive approximation converter, principle is very simple. You put a signal, the signal first compares whether suppose this is initially this is 0, initially this is 0, right. So, so this just compares whether this should be this is higher or this is higher. So, if this is higher, it puts it 1. Now, when it puts it 1, it sets the this is some logic. So, this so this will put the maximum bit high that will no so maximum bit means v by 2 so it, so that will come through the da converter and will apply a v by 2 here now the question is whether this analog signal is greater than v by 2 or 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 less than v by 2 if it is greater than v by 2 then it's still one then the next bit will be put so in this way first the msb is put then the next bit put till this signal crosses this signal and then at that level it is stopped so, so that so, so that's how you 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 just compare it with a with a number of digital uh, uh, number of digital numbers till it exceeds and at that point you stop. So you get so when you stop you get a set of digital bits which is closest to this analog signal, right? So this is how you convert uh, this this is how a typical successive approximation converter is, and just one way there are many various other converters for example a very fast converter is called flash adc we are not going to discuss that because we don't have enough time but uh, this is this is a converter where you know there you, you do it bit by bit so you need at least uh, worst case you can need n times you can go through this cycle of setting and resetting bits so you need more time on the other hand in this converter the whole conversion is just in 
one clock cycle so it's much faster but then it requires a huge resistance network and they have to be very very precise otherwise you are going to get errors so this is a converter which is therefore this converter uh, has some problems and although it is very fast so we are going to, we are not going to look at that too, too much if you compare there are various kinds of converters and we are for example there are there are other converters too we are talking about flash we should saw successive approximation there are some converters which are called uh, voltage to frequency or uh, integrating converters which are uh, very slow but but very accurate so you can have typical idea about the number of bits flash is 4 to 8 bits typically less number of bits but very fast uh, conversion so you can go up to you know 500 megahertz kind of uh, conversions then successive approximation is very widely used 8 to 16 bits possible generally and medium sampling rates for most processes successive approximation is good enough and then you have integrating converters which are quite slow but very accurate because they do an input averaging over a long time and therefore they take have good response to noise uh -uh. so so having seen that so now we have seen eddy conversion now we come to a, the system level discussion that typically there are two kinds of data acquisition systems that you find one are called external bus or remote so there what happens is that the computer is in a separate place generally and uh, oops i don't know what's happening So, uh, so you see here th these are all these signals analog signals are getting terminated let us assume that it is signal conditioned we are not it, if it is not that then it will it will be conditioned then the eddy conversion we have seen what is any conversion then now what happens is that the, is that this thing this physical these systems boxes are separate are situated at a separate place they have they have their own separate power supplies they are situated possibly much closer to the field and then here the so, so after any con so and they have their own processors so the value is fi firstly coming to that em embedded communication controller processor and then using some very standard communication protocol either you know rs232 422 485 or IEEE 488 there are number of protocols by which through computer communication it is coming to what is known as the host computer where this data is going to be used so this is a small box which is going to be close to the process and then one wire is going to come generally serial communication coming to the computer so this is an external bus remote data acquisition system the advantages are that they can they can connect to any host computer so it's so close to the field right disadvantage is that generally data acquisition rates are limited because of this serial communication so you can it, it, you get slightly slower rates of communication but the, if but if that's good enough for you it's okay second second kinds of things are internal pc bus data acquisition systems where the data acquisition system sits right inside the pc box right so and then they they will communicate with the pc through the through the pci bus which is much higher speed and which is parallel interfacing right so the data acquisition rates can go much faster but but it but this means that the pc has to go close to the field otherwise you are going to have long cablings to the pc right so similarly these are generally designed for specific uh, machines like the like the like windows pcs so this is a this is a typical picture of a pc data acquisition board so what happens is that the board itself has a cpu which transfers the data because it sits on the pc bus so it will transfer the data to the pc memory and then the cp pc cpu can actually take it from the memory and then do a do a display right so they are they are generally designed for the this you know kind of windows kind of pcs and they are very common and they are rather cheap and especially can be used in a very much in a in a laboratory scenario and widely used so these are the basic these are the basic two types of data acquisition systems if you take it if you take a typical specification of a data acquisition system they they will they will mention things like you know power consumption see 5 volt supply has lot of current requirement because of the digital circuits then a 12 volt supply for analog 
the number of channels is this very important typically you have about eight analog channels either single ended you can have eight single ended uh, eight differential or sing, uh, 16 single ended channels typically number of digital channels are much more 64 uh, like that because they take only one signal each resolution says what how many bit converter is being used so it's a 12 bit converter accuracy the ad converter type then uh, you know this this full scale the, this is the this is the this is the dynamic range so it is saying that the that the dynamic range is 0 to 10 volt dc then the ad converter codes can be available in in various formats whether it's uh, two's complement uh, true binary offset binary various kinds of digital codes are there the sig this these two specification gain and zero drift specifications are for the signal conditioning block which is there in the this thing so that if they, they they will have an amplifier and that amplifier gain variation and zero drift can be specified and finally the the acquisition time which says that the acquisition time is of the order of 4 microseconds you know so these are these are typical uh, specifications of a data acquisition system which you need to look at when you select one so uh, oops similarly finally is a data acquisition software i don't want to talk much about it only thing is that uh, sometimes uh, you can either go for you know these these data acquisition softwares will only come up with some certain drivers, and then you can write your own C or basic programs to use the data acquisition systems. But that requires a lot of programming, although it can give you a lot of I mean flexibility in the sense that you can do anything you want with the data. The, the raw data is made available, but this requires a lot of programming, and often in, in an industrial situation, it's not preferred. So you people use data acquisition software packages. So in programmable software, you uh, the advantage is flexibility and the disadvantage is complexi complexity and a very steep learning curve. While uh, if you have data acquisition software, then it does not require programming. Generally, it requires you know graphical programming in the sense that you know, using very common sense and domain related uh, quantities, you can actually figure uh, configure the system and get data and then display it. So it enables developers to, to design custom instruments best suited to their application. There are various examples. For example, a common one in with which I am familiar is LabVIEW, but there are few others also. So we have so what we have done during this course, this lesson, uh, we have seen the architecture of data acquisition systems. We have seen the sampling concepts. We have seen the some details of analog to digital conversion, and finally we have taken a look at some data acquisition hardware and software features. So, points to ponder is mentioned three ways in which signal conditioning affects conversion accuracy. So, I have already talked about dynamic range, you can think of some others. State where simultaneous sampling and hold is necessary and where it is not. So, as I said, it is related to the, to the frequency content of the signals and the speed of conversion of your eddy converter and the number of channels of course. What happens if an anti-aliasing filter is not used before an ADC? So you have to go through if the ADC is successive approximation or if the ADC is flash. So choose the ADC and then go through it and see is that suppose in the middle, suppose the, the signal just goes to zero, then what will happen? Sometimes it may give you wrong results, sometimes it may not. Name three typical functions of a data acquisition software. So one of them could be display. You can figure out the other two by looking at some of the some of these software which are advertised on the internet. So that is all for today, thank you very much.